So I just want to uh, frame the, the talk this morning with um, a single verse that most of you will recognize. John chapter 3, verse 7. I still read from an analog Bible. <laughs> Both because I'm old school, but also I've talked with a lot of pastors over the years, and the one thing that they all agree on, there aren't many things they all agree on, but one thing they do all agree on is people who read Bibles like this one, they don't have to have leather covers, but paper, you know, analog Bibles, somehow have a deeper spirituality. They do. It sounds funny, but they actually do. They get more out of their study, they, they retain more, they somehow are more grounded, and you know, as the old saying goes, people with worn Bibles have lives that are not. So, these are the words of Jesus. And he says, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And we might, without doing violence to the text, look at the Greek underlying this English translation, and we might say, do not marvel that I said to you that you must all, plural, be born again. The Spirit blows where he wishes, and you hear his sound. But you do not know where he comes from or where he goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So when we speak of wind or spirit, which one did Jesus mean? Well, not completely clear. And for our purposes, it might be somehow more appropriate to say, uh, to say the Spirit, not the wind. So people of the Spirit are people who are responsive to the Spirit. And if, if you will, to extend the metaphor, that means all of us are little more than a, than a driven leaf. All we can do is go where the Spirit leads us or maybe takes us or maybe <sighs> blows us at times. And because of that, as Jesus famously said and is, has become a, a watchword in the vineyard, we can only do what the Father is doing. And so Mark uh, generously asked me to come and talk about how do we recognize what the Father is doing. This is something that in the old days when John was around, um, you know, he's been gone 20 years uh, next year. When John was around, he would say, oh, the Spirit's on that one, or see, the Lord's doing this there. And everybody would kind of look and go, I don't see anything. What's he looking at? What's he talking about? And we used, to, we used to teach on these things to try to bring people up the ramp. So I want to I try and revisit some of this lore of the vineyard by starting with a story. Now, all peoples everywhere have a story. Stories are what bind the people together and they are what give that people an identity. Sometimes those stories are bound up with God himself as in the stories of denominations, as in the story of this movement. And when he becomes involved, well then those stories become his stories, or just make it singular, it becomes his story or history. That's really what history is supposed to be about. It is supposed to be about God's story of what he does in space and time. But not all that passes as history is really history. True history is holy history. It is the acts of God that are somehow saving. They make a difference. They are milestones and epochs. They change the way the world is. The German theologians call it Heilsgeschichte. It is holy history. It is different from that which you see on CNN because when we encounter God in his dealings in space and time, we are ourselves changed and we are bonded together by that encounter. Now, sometimes a people forgets its own story. And when this happens, that people loses its sense of identity. We could think, for example, of tribal peoples all over the world. And it doesn't much matter whether we talk about Brazil or Indonesia or the highlands of Mexico or maybe the Native Americans. Um, these so-called primitive peoples are collectively losing their story because, well, because times are changing and as times change, people don't always retain who they were. So the vineyard story, vineyard history, begins in the late 1970s, not with John Wimber, but with a man named Ken Gullickson, somebody who is not well-remembered these days, and a small church on the west side of Los Angeles. 
But these were heady days. These, these were the days of the Jesus People movement. These were the days when Keith Green was at his heyday. And these are the days when Bob Dylan was famously coming to faith. Now, John Wimber was a man who was a member of the Righteous Brothers Band. Maybe that was prophetic, and you can decide for yourself what you think about that. <laughs> but he was a musician and a composer. He'd been born in Missouri, and he always retained a flavor of that show-me attitude of the show-me state, even though he didn't live there for very long. And his father left the day he was born. And he was not easily impressed, and he wanted substance we could say even in spiritual matters, but maybe we should say especially in spiritual matters. And so John was converted through the ministry of a welder named Gunnar Payne, and he developed a passion for evangelism through Gunnar. I, I used to live in Orange County, California. I now live in Los Angeles. Um, but all over Orange County, I have met people at different times that when they find out that I worked for John, they will tell me, John Wimber led me to the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. John had a passion for winning souls. One time I was talking with an executive in a major corporation in Orange County, and he said to me, Vineyard, he said, did you know Johnny Wimber? And I said, I don't think anybody would have dared called him Johnny, but yeah, I knew Johnny Wimber. Uh, and he told me his own story of his encounters with John. But John went on, he grew up into Christian maturity, he entered the ministry through the Quaker church, and he became first an assistant pastor, later a senior pastor. And in time, the church that he was pastoring became the largest Quaker church in the United States, your Belinda Friends Church. It's still there today. And this caught the attention of uh, one C. Peter Wagner, a professor at Fuller Seminary who taught church growth and who happened also to run the Fuller Institute of Church Growth Peter recruited John to come work for him, and so John resigned his pastorate and worked with Peter for about four years, and he became a consultant who advised churches on how to grow, traveling from approximately 1973 to 1977. Now, it's interesting because John Wimber became synonymous with signs, wonders, and church growth. He became known as the man who, well, led the vineyard movement. Most people think he founded it. I've already dispelled that myth, but... Nevertheless, he was the one who was responsible for its early uh, epic growth. But, you know, in those days, John didn't know too much about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I, one, one time I was ministering in another state, and someone came up to me and said, you know, I hired John Wimber as a consultant to help me grow my church back when he was at Fuller. And I said, really, what did he tell you to do? What were his, what were his best ideas? He said, well, he told us that we should go down to the local bakery and buy the longest bread roll we could get. And so we went to the local baker and we found that they could actually bake a, a, a bread loaf that was about 30 feet long. And so we bought this 30 foot long roll and per John's instructions, we brought it back to the church and we cut it you know, in half and we made the world's largest hoagie and then we went and put door hangers on every door in our community saying, come eat from the largest hoagie sandwich in the world. Now, if, if that sounds a little bit different from what we think of as vineyard, that shows you the measure of change that the coming of the Holy Spirit will have in a man's life. <laughs> what was that? Was the prophetic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. But you know, one night in Detroit, Michigan, the Holy Spirit woke John up by shoving him out of bed. Now, I know for some people that's going to be Problematic. They would say the Holy Spirit's a gentleman and would never do that, but this is what happened. And John landed on the floor with a resounding thud because at the time he weighed about 375 pounds. He was a big boy. And the Holy Spirit spoke to John on the floor of that hotel room in the middle of the night while he was lying there, and he said this. He said, John, I've seen your ministry. And as he would report in his own testimony, I'm not telling tales out of school, um, the tone in the voice of God was sort of, eh, I've seen your testimony, John. Now I'm going to show you mine. And the Spirit said to him further, go home and pastor the church that I have already started. And so John went home to become the pastor of a church with seven people. That church was Calvary Chapel, Yorba Linda, and the year was 1977. The church started in 
the home of Carl Tuttle's sister. Some of you will know the name of Carl Tuttle. Candy Wickwire and John's wife Carol was involved. And it met in the Wickwire's living room. And John didn't think very much of this church. He didn't think very much of this group. They sang too long and they cried a lot. But as Carol Wimber would later say, they were tired of being Pharisees. They were tired of going through the motions. They were tired of trying hard to be good. They were tired of following the rules. They wanted to know God. They wanted something more. And over time, the church grew, and it, it you know, grew from seven to a few hundred. Its first uh, outside the living room home was the Masonic Lodge in Yorba Linda, probably not its most auspicious location. Um, later, it moved to an elementary school, then to Esperanza Junior High School, and finally to Canyon High School on the west side of the 91 Freeway at Imperial Highway. That high school is still there, but very few people today know anything about all that went on there. In early 1979, the Jesus People movement was waning. It had kind of run its main course. That movement had been centered about 20 miles away at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, headed by Chuck Smith. And thousands were converted through the ministries of Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee. And actually, few know it, but it's true. Also, the ministry of Paul Kane, who for a long time journeyed with Chuck Smith, but then they had a falling out over none other than the things of the Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Calvary Chapel of Yorba Linda, as it was then known, it would later move to become a vineyard and move from Yorba Linda to Anaheim. So today, the Anaheim Vineyard is the successor and the church that Christy Wimber uh, runs in Yorba Linda. It is also called Vineyard Yorba Linda, but it's not the same congregation. Um, Calvary Chapel Yorba Linda always had something different about it. And eventually those differences caused Chuck Smith to invite uh, Calvary Chapel Yorba Linda to leave the Calvary Chapel movement. And so John Wimber and Ken Gullickson had met one another by this time, and they found an easy rapport. And Ken willingly turned over the leadership of this fledgling movement of churches, at that time numbering six, um, to the leadership of John Wimber because he recognized something in John, and he said, I think this guy's got a better shot at leading this movement than I do. And it was during this same period that Lonnie Frisbee began visiting the vineyard Yorba Linda. The next phase was what I call the Mother's Day Massacre. Now, no one's ever actually called it the Mother's Day Massacre, I don't think in print. But one day, as Lonnie was there, the Holy Spirit spoke to John and pointed Lonnie out in the crowd, and he said, invite that young man to preach. And so on Mother's Day 1980, Lonnie preached to the church. And as I've already said, it hasn't been normally called the Mother's Day Massacre, but what happened in the room that day was so epic that, um, well, it might as well have been a massacre because there were bodies all over the floor. This was a church that was not charismatic and people were screaming in tongues. One of them, my friend um, Tim Pfeiffer, who is today the general counsel of a major corporation here in the Denver area, as he fell to the floor under the power of the Holy Spirit, as it happened, and it was purely happenstance, he was an 18-year-old guy at the time, he kind of hooked one of the microphones with his arm, kind of like this, and as he, as he fell to the floor, probably more like this, but as he fell to the floor, the mic was right up against his mouth, and he was screaming in tongues into the microphone, and it's reverberating <laughs> through the entire gymnasium. Everyone under 25 years of age had been invited to come forward, and as the proverbial saying goes, the Holy Spirit fell like a bomb. Up the back, people slammed their Bibles, put them under their arm, and walked out the door. John has reported on this in recordings that are widely available. And he was himself distraught. He went home that day wondering if he even had a church left. Prayed all night, searching the scriptures for signs of the things that he had seen with his own eyes as the Holy Spirit was moving. And in those days, there was a man that was closely associated with John. I think anybody who was around in those years would have said he was unquestionably the number two man in the movement, and his name was Tom Stipe. He was a Calvary Chapel pastor here in Denver, Colorado, and at 5 a.m., the phone rang. It was Tom Stipe calling John, and he said, John, I have a word for you from the Lord. John said, what is it? I need a word from the Lord. 
And Tommy said, now him we did call Tommy. Tommy said, John, it's me. And it began. John would later report that people wanted to know, just how far is this thing going to go? And he would famously reply, no further than this book. Somehow that was comforting to many people, and as John would like to say, they obviously hadn't read the book. <laughs> but this, this birthed something that was uh, you know, a, a global movement. It, it birthed something that was a newfound approach to evangelism, to church life, and to church planning. One of John's famous phrases, and he, he assiduously stuck to this, it drove people crazy, especially people who had agendas or who were control freaks. But this was one of his famous sayings, why can't we just let the Holy Spirit run the church? And so this became one of the hallmark emphases of the vineyard. Also, there was an emphasis on what we today call power evangelism, and with it, the theological underpinnings of the kingdom of God. Evangelism was not just to be about preaching the word. It was to be about both proclamation and demonstration, and in the demonstration of the reality of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this would bring many people to faith. The church followed the teaching of John by growing 1,000 people during that summer. 1,000 people. And by the way, these were baptized people. These weren't people who prayed a prayer and were never seen again. Now, during my time working with John, people began visiting in droves and literally from around the world to see and experience what the Spirit was doing. And as Sonny said, during this time, we planted our first 200 vineyard churches. And we did this most particularly by trying to follow what the Holy Spirit was doing. And so during that period of time, we had epic, that's really the only right word you can use, epic, game-changing moves of the Spirit in key locations all across the United States. One of them was in Marion, Illinois. Nobody really thinks much about Marion, Illinois. It's, it's 200 miles down the road from nowhere. Um, it's in the coal country in the southern part of the state, but the Holy Spirit fell so powerfully at Marion, Illinois, that, well, the ministry of Randy Clark was birthed out of those meetings, and I was there for them. Um, and at one point, no one had cell phones in those days. We were holding the meetings, and all of a sudden, the fire department broke in through the back of the church while we were holding the meeting, and they said someone had phoned in to say that the church was on fire. And when they had pulled up in front of the church, there were flames leaping out of the belfry of the church. And so they stormed up the steeple, with their hoses and axes in their full turnout gear, only to find there was no fire. There was only flames as of fire over the church. True story. Champaign, Illinois, pastored by Happy Layman, was at the time known as Good News Center, and it was associated with a Christian cult called Faith Assembly, led by one Hobart Freeman. The Holy Spirit fell like a nuclear warhead in that particular church when we went there. And the entire complexion of that church changed. And as any of you know, Happy's been on the board of the Vineyard Movement for 25 years or so. Everybody lost the head coverings. The women got rid of the long skirts. The family sizes shrunk from 12 or more to something more approximating <laughs> normal life. <laughs> Hap's going to kill me for telling all this <laughs> publicly, but these things are true. I could name other places. It sounds like the world tour of a rock band. Evanston, Illinois, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Columbus, New York City, Baltimore, Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Baton Rouge. Every place we went, the power of God moved in, in great force, great magnitude. Mike and Betty Fry, who were, where's Mike? Here's Betty. Oh, there's Mike. Mike and Betty Fry were part of the, I don't know, the Rolling Thunder Review in those days. And, you know, we went to Hong Kong and, you know, we saw fingers grow out that didn't exist under the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, and people came to the Lord. In that particular story, um, the finger belonged to a woman who was married to a, uh, an atheist doctor. He came the next day, gave his life to Christ, as he would, as did his partner. These were the kinds of things that were birthed by these moves of the Spirit, and this is what we, were, this is what we signed up for when we 
when we joined the Vineyard Movement. Amen. Now, the question that Mark asked me to address was, how do we know the signs of the Spirit? What are, what are these things that we look for when we talk about the Holy Spirit moving? And so with that, I want to give you a handful of scriptures. Now, I'm not going to turn in my analog Bible for these because we won't have the time. i got to mind the thingy here. But um, I, I will give you the scriptures and read them, and you, know, you can research them later if you choose. But one of the things that, that made John somewhat unique is he was less interested in dogmatics than in phenomenology. Now, those are two big words, so let me tell you what I mean by that. Dogmatics is what the church has tended to emphasize for most of 1900 years. It's the teaching of dogma, of doctrine, and it, it tends to be propositional truth, and it tends to be highly scholastic, and I might say at times somewhat dry. That's what the church has tended to emphasize. It's not that John didn't believe in good doctrine or dogma. It's just that he was more interested in encountering God and experiencing and living with God. And in that sense, then, he had a, a strong interest in the phenomena that went with the spirits visiting. Remember, he'd come out of Quaker roots. And the Quakers themselves were called the Quakers. Why? Because they quaked. Because they shook when the Holy Spirit would come around. And there was a strong emphasis in the Quaker tradition on the inner light and on hearing the voice of God for yourself. And so probably more than anyone else, John popularized the kind of phraseology that we use today, the Lord spoke to me, or I heard God say. Sometimes people do that too much. But one thing that amazed me about John when I first met him was when he said it, he was right. He would say things God said and it would come to pass. I had never met anybody who could do that before. And so it, it had a prophetic component as well as a power component to it. And when you merge the prophetic and power, it has the ability to arrest people's attention and pull them out of wherever they are into a completely parallel universe, maybe without even changing their clothes. But there's a, there's a complete sea change that happens in the way they think about the world. So the first sign of the Spirit's coming is we look for trembling and shaking. Isaiah 66, 2 says this, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. So the idea of trembling is in fact found in the scripture, phenomenologically, not dogmatically. And in Daniel 10, 10, Daniel talks about seeing, a, seeing an angel and the angel bringing him a word, Daniel 10, 10, then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Now, that trembling is pretty clear what that means, but note that Daniel was on his hands and knees. And to you know, take preacher's liberty here, that means he was kind of like this, which means somehow he'd been knocked down from his standing position when he encountered God, and he's kind of doing like this. And so, you know, in those days, you would see people like that. Sometimes they weren't even on their hands and knees. They'd be flat on the floor under the power of God. And if you remember some of those visitations, maybe when there was a renewal that hit under Toronto, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. For some, this can be highly offensive, but it does actually have scriptural foundation, just phenomenological foundation as opposed to dogmatic foundation, because I assure you, you will never find John Calvin writing about these things. <laughs> Second sign of the Spirit's coming is falling. The shorthand lingo that became popular is to be slain in the Spirit, John 18, four through six, then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, this is in the garden of Gethsemane, came forward and said to the soldiers, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That's what it says right there. Now, I read... Um, a dozen commentaries on this passage preparing for this message just to be sure I wasn't off. And every single one of them described this passage and explained away how it doesn't really say what it says. Because they were looking for the dogmatic, not the phenomenological interpretation. But here it is. They fell backward when Jesus declared who he was. Revelation 1.17, John the Revelator, the Apostle John says, when I saw him... I fell at his feet like a dead man. Now, if you've ever watched somebody die fast, they, they, they just drop. They don't even, they don't fall one way or another. They just sort of collapse. And um, 
There's a lot of places you could see that happen, starting with most modern war movies. But anyway, the point is, John describes this same phenomenon when he encountered the Lord. Now, again, for some people, they're like, I don't like being slain in the spirit. Where's that in the Bible? Well, I just showed you, so now we can do it. <laughs> Third phenomenon that we see, not just falling, not just falling backward, but falling face down. Now, this one's a little more, uh, I don't know, risque, avant-garde. Genesis 17, 3, Abraham fell on his face while God talked to him about the covenant that he was about to make with him. Fell on his face. That means he's talking with God and he went like that. I think nowadays we call it planking. But that's what Abraham did. Ezekiel 3, 23, so I got up and went out on the plain and behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory I saw by the Kibar River and I fell on my face. Now we read that and we've dumbed it down and we take it to mean so I got down and I prayed. That's not what it says. It says I fell on my face. And so when the Spirit of God began moving on that Mother's Day morning and in subsequent years through the ministry of the Vineyard Movement, sometimes people would encounter the Spirit of God and if you've ever seen any Reinhard Bonnke videos, of his crusades in Africa, it's like a scythe in a wheat field. People just being cut down by the power of God. There's really no other way to describe it. It sounds kind of intense, and it is, but somehow people love it. <laughs> you know, Do it some more, God. And it was actually out of that experience that we developed the famous vineyard phraseology for praying, more Lord, do it some more. Daniel 8, 17, so he came near to where I was standing, and when he came, I was frightened, and I fell on my face. So again, we see the same phenomenon. Ph phenomena. Fourth distinctive sign, sometimes people fall into stupor. Some people like to call that trances, but this stupor one is more like people are, you know, they're waiting on the Lord, and they just seem to kind of zone out, and, you know, maybe their head droops, or their body gets a little bit limp, but it, it, it sort of looks like that, at least when it starts. And it says in Genesis 15, 12, that when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. Now, he did fall asleep. The scripture does say that. But he was busy offering a sacrifice when it happened, and I would submit to you that he fell asleep as part of this falling into some sort of a spirit reverie, if you like that language. Daniel 10, 9, but I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. Evidently, Daniel liked to do face plants. <laughs> Matthew 26, 40, which is uh, mirrored by Mark 14, 37, then Jesus returned to the disciples. Now, he's up there on the Mount of Olives praying, and he found them sleeping. He found them in a stupor. He found them in some sort of altered state. Number five, bodily manifestations. Jeremiah says this, Jeremiah 20, verse 9, Then in my heart uh, it is as it were a burning fire shut up in my bones. And oftentimes in those years people would experience phenomena with God where they would feel like fire was in their bodies or on their lips or in their hands. Or they would feel electricity or something that felt like you'd poured some sort of carbonated drink on their hands or in their arms or their legs or in their trunk, but they were having an internal sensation of God's spirit moving on them. And that didn't usually end there, but it might begin there. And so there would be these various other signs of tingling and numbness and dizziness and altered perspiration. And, you know, as we would look out over the room, we would look for people who were starting to show some of the signs that I'm, I'm describing to you, and in meetings that I've led at different times, and it, it varies with the context, I have literally seen at different times people being knocked out of their seats by the Spirit of God. I did a meeting in Australia last year um, in which about half the congregation looked like they'd, they were sitting in ejection seats in an airplane or something, because they just sort of, and they just kind of landed as the Spirit of God began moving over the room. I could tell you more, but I don't want to stretch you too far. Other distinctive signs of the Spirit are actually to see in the Spirit. This is one of the ways that we recognize where the Spirit of God is moving. We learn to recognize in the Spirit 
where God is about to touch down and who his hand is upon. John 1.47, when uh, Nathanael is brought before Jesus, he says, Here is a true Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit or in whom, in whom there is no guile. What was Jesus doing? Well, he was not judging by outward appearances as the Lord had spoken to Samuel the prophet. Instead, he was judging by the character of the man, what was inside of him, and he could see into the heart of the man. And so another sign would be Acts 2.3, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. At times in meetings, even in the modern period, we've had those instances where people are being filled with the Spirit and it does literally appear that there are flames over their head. And most people think of like a little candle flame. When I've seen them, they tend to be about as tall as the person. So, you know, Mark over there, what are you, about six foot three? Six foot five, all right. So think of a six foot five flame above Mark's six foot five body and you've got a 13 foot high stack of, you know, whatever that is. Spirit and man mixed together. But when you see these things in the spirit, they, they tend to look a bit like a, some sort of a discontinuity or it will be like just things peel back and you can see something that you wouldn't normally be able to see with your literal physical eyes. I was leading a meeting in Central America last year and there was a man there with a fatal disease and he, he stood up at the altar call with a bunch of other people and as I, we'd had a, a couple of private prayer sessions with him and nothing had happened. It was miserable and it, I, I didn't want to do it again. But anyway, during this ministry time, as I saw him stand up, all of a sudden I saw out of the corner of my eye something and I turned and looked and the way it looked to me, you can argue with the way I'm describing it if you like, but this is my best way of describing it. It looked like a javelin. It was about this long of a shaft, about so wide. And, you know, when I look at the screen or the camera or, you know, any of you here, you're, you're quite clear to me. I can see through the clear mountain air and your faces are quite distinct. Um, but this javelin was like a discontinuity in the air, like you would see above a candle flame when the candle is lit. And I saw this thing come from there, and it was moving at him at about the speed of sound. And I just pointed at him, and I said, the power of God's on you. And it, the power hit him so hard, it knocked him off his feet, threw him on his back to the floor. Five guys around him were also knocked down by the power of God, and he was instantaneously healed of his life-threatening condition, a blood disease. Now, you, you can only do that when you can do it. It's, you, know, you can't just sort of say, I'm going to try and look cool. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but when it's on, it's on. And in those years of the early vineyard, those sorts of things were commonplace. And what happened in Central America last year would be an indication of that. So all of these things kind of fall into this general bucket of seeing in the spirit. Of course, this one is quite famous, speaking in other languages. We call it speaking in tongues, but that's only because we're still using King James English. And in those days, another language was called another tongue. Now, of course, Acts 2.4 comes immediately to mind. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so even to this day, we routinely see people filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. But Isaiah 28.11, which is, by the way, quoted in 1 Corinthians 14.21, it says this, For by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue or a foreign language will the Lord speak to his people. So, again, a lot of times people say, why do we need tongues? Well, because the scripture makes it clear that this too is one of the hallmarks of the Holy Spirit's coming. How about this one, changed countenance? Something changes on the face of a person. He, Exodus 34 29, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. Exodus 34, 35, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. How about Matthew 17, 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Or how about this one, Acts 6, 15, when they looked upon Stephen, they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, one of the things that we look for when, we're, when the Spirit is moving, whether it's in a Starbucks restaurant or in a conference setting like this one, is we look for those whom the Lord will highlight to us. Now, sometimes it will literally appear as though a spotlight is shining on them, even though they're sitting in a dark corner of the room. 
Other times you'll just walk into the room and you'll look around and there'll be somebody that will jump out at you and you'll say, I, I have something for that person. You might not even know yet what it is. And it's only as you get near to them that suddenly that word drops onto you or that power gift drops onto you and so you're in the moment. I hate living this way. It's utterly dependent on the Lord. <laughs> and if he, doesn't, if he doesn't do what he's, you know, what he has already pledged himself to do, we end up in a world of hurt, right? But this, was, this too is something, this changed countenance. And so we look for that sign and it's, it's particularly easy when you're you know, in a podium or in a pulpit and you're preaching, you look out over the crowd and you say, well, who's the Lord moving on? Oh, I can see that guy back there. The Lord's on him. I saw you when I walked in yesterday and immediately the Lord spoke to me about you and I had a word for you, although you don't know it yet. So, you know, these things, they, they come that way and you have to learn, not unlike what we were just doing in our contemplative prayer exercise. You have to learn to kind of dial down and be aware of what's going on around you because most of us are not aware enough of what's happening with our own emotional state, our own temperament, and certainly in our own bodies. The Spirit of God may be giving you indications all the time of what he wants to do, but if you aren't in touch with all of that, you're going to have a problem because you'll miss the very things he's trying to speak to you. How about this one, Acts 14, 9, Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be well said to the man, get up and walk. A lot of times in meetings that I've done, and I'd say this is more common in the, the non-first world, so not the G10, but I do see it as well in the G10 countries. Um, you know, we'll look at people and we will see that there is a unique something on their face, and it's called faith. They have confidence. They absolutely know that they're going to believe. I remember being in Western Australia a couple of years ago, and there was a man sitting right down on the front, right where Ed is sitting. And um, I didn't know anything about his condition, but I could see that he had faith to be healed. And I said, sir, what's the matter with you? And he said, uh, I had a stroke. He looked to be about 35 years old. Turned out he was 37. He had three kids, and he'd had a stroke three years before and was paralyzed. So I, I couldn't even say to him, at least without a miraculous intervention, stand up. But I said, oh, well, you have faith to be healed. And he said, yes, I came here expecting to be healed. And at that moment, the Spirit of God came on him, and he got right up out of his seat. And the last scene I saw of that man was he was dancing with his three children. What are some other examples? I told Mark I'd give a few of these before I ended the talk. You know, I remember some years ago during the Anaheim Vineyard years, um, there was a woman that I was uh, working with, a young woman that was coming to a home group I was leading, and she had all kinds of difficulty with her father, who happened, by the way, to be a judge. And one day we got some sandwiches and went to the park to talk, and as we were sitting there and she's describing all of these issues that she's having with her dad, I see written right across her face the word incest. And I'm thinking, I don't want to give that word. You know, it's all cool to talk about, I got a word from the Lord, but what do you do when it's something that's not clean and neat? And so I said, you know, um, I, I had the kind of a friendship with her that, and it was only a friendship, but I had the kind of friendship with her that I could, you know, broach a topic. And I said, I just got to ask you, um, I'm seeing this word incest written over your face. I said, you wouldn't be sleeping with your dad, would you? And she turned as white as this iPad cover. And she said, you can never say anything about that. He's a judge. He'll go to jail. He'll be impeached. And of course, the thing blew sky high, and I wasn't his most favorite person because, as it turned out, she'd been his bedmate since she was 12 years old. She was 19 at the time. So the Lord will blow things like that open, but you know that word was, a, was critical to her coming to faith in the Lord. And so these things can actually, even though they can be uncomfortable, they are, they are essential in this dimension of what we call power evangelism. One other story, um, we were in Indonesia a couple of years ago and we were holding some healing meetings and you know, we were having, we were having kind of everything you can think of and things you couldn't believe go on. One woman had had... Uh, she came up at the end of the meeting and she had what looked to be corn nuts in her hand. You all know what corn nuts are, right? Okay, so she looked like she had a handful of corn nuts and she walked up and through a translator, uh, I said, well, what, what is that? 
And she said, well, um, I was sent home to die with breast cancer, and the cancers were erupting through my skin. The doctors said they couldn't do anything about it, so they told me to get my affairs in order. I, I had very little time to live. But when the power of God came into the room, I felt fire go through my body. There's that phenomenon again. And she said, I thought to myself, Something's happened because my chest was burning and I went into the women's room and I opened my bra and these are my cancers that were lying in the bottom of my bra and, and all my skin is normal. And she's holding the cancers in her hand. She was later medically verified by um, numerous medical procedures that she was healed. Well, anyway, word of this started to go out and we were in West Papua, which is, you know, jungle, tribe, mountainous, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, people groups up there, they may not be very big, they have their own unique languages. And you know, you guys are the missions people, you understand what language groups are about. So to have a language group, you don't necessarily need a lot of people. You, you just need them, whoever they are, to share that language. And so there was this one tribe, they were living in a swamp, and they lived in tree houses. And there was about 350 people in this tribe, and the only people on earth who spoke their language were them, but they also spoke this pigeon patois that all the highland tribes shared among themselves is neither Indonesian nor anything else, just they all spoke it as kind of a common trade language up in the hills and highlands of, of West Papua. So anyway, the chief said, let's go get healed because we're all sick. So they all came down out of their tree houses and they walked three days to the meetings that we were holding. And when they came into the meetings, they said, we came to be healed. And all of them who came to be healed, literally to a person, were healed of the conditions that they had whatever they had, whether it was a crippling condition, blindness, uh, teeth falling out, whatever, everything was going on. But then we said to them, do you know Jesus? Well, they didn't. They were a Stone Age tribe, and let's just say their, uh, their attire was minimalist. <laughs> so the chief said, we want to follow this Jesus. It was a classic people movement, a Christian Kaiser or a you know, Don Richardson peace child kind of a moment. Um, and the whole tribe prayed to receive the Christ en masse. 350 people gave their lives to the Lord at once. And then the Holy Spirit again fell like a nuclear warhead. And there was just a pile of bodies all over the room. People on top of people stacked up like cordwood, screaming in tongues, vibrating under the power of God, experiencing all that we'd seen in the gymnasium years ago and that has continued on in the work of the Holy Spirit since that day. Now, I could give many other uh, examples, but I'm watching the timer and I'm aware that the time has run out. And one of the other things that uh, Mark asked me to do was to have a ministry time. Because, you know, one of the things that we learned out of those early years was this. The wisdom of man is a good thing, and education is a good thing, but these things of the Spirit cannot be accomplished through the wisdom of man. They can only be accomplished by the power of God. In fact, this was what Paul said, that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And so... Um, I've tried to give you from Scripture some examples of, uh, of scriptural phenomena that match to the things that we see, that we did see and continue to see all over the world in what we're doing. And I would just uh, you know, want to give a word of encouragement, really, that what I'm describing, this is not something from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. This is the birthright of the vineyard. This is what we were born into. Most people who were attracted to the vineyard in the early days came because in all of that that I've described, as crazy and weird and messy as it can be, they saw something that was real, something that they knew was unmistakably God. And it caused them to move forever beyond that horrible modern condition of equivocating between faith and unbelief. And you know, a double-minded man or woman is unstable in all of his or her ways. And so in those early years, we, we had people who came, and as one friend of mine from Dallas used to say, they got saved hard. <laughs> but you know, they didn't back up again. They didn't, they didn't wander away from what they had signed up for. And you know, all over the world, the Holy Spirit is running at flood tide. The river is running high. The power of God is in evidence. In the last three years, I have personally seen over 150 cripples and paralytics healed. 
quadriplegics, paraplegics, every kind of paraplegia and any sort of mobility thing, people with cervical dystonia and this, that, and the other thing. One guy got healed complaining about it while he hit the floor under the power of God. I've seen the blind see. We've seen, uh, you know, we've seen the uh, deaf hear. At one point, we were on a run in, Western, uh, in the western part of Australia. I had a team of four Australians that was traveling with me. We prayed for 400 people who had stage three and stage four cancer. And we kept a log of who they were and where they lived so we could follow them up. Three of them died. The rest were healed. It was astounding. I believe the Lord wants that kind of release to be on the vineyard, a fresh and a new it's recovering our roots, but it's actually going beyond our roots. I had breakfast with Carol Wimber not that long ago, and I was telling her about some of the things that I'm seeing, and she said, Ken, this is, this is beyond anything that we knew in the early vineyard. She said, we got to push into this. Keep going. Just keep go. Just go, go. Don't, don't look back. Don't stop. And this morning, she sent me a text, and she knew I was going to be talking to you, and she said, don't hold anything back. So it's not mine to give. But it is mine to say, I believe the Holy Spirit wants this for all of us. And I believe he wants to do it in India. And he wants to do it in Turkey. And he wants to do it in Pakistan and Indonesia and in Russia and in Zambia and in Kenya. And he wants to do it in Brazil and Argentina. And if I left your country out, please know I'm just giving a representative list. It's not meant to be exhaustive. Because Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, but teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. And of course, that doesn't just mean serving communion and going to Sunday school. It means to heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the lepers and drive out demons. These things are still going on all over the world. And he said, if you will do that, he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the ministry of Jesus has never been rescinded. In some quarters, the nasty little error of um, cessationism has crept in. But you know, it's right there in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. He says, if you will do these things, I will go with you and I will do everything I always did during my ministry until the end of time. There's your answer to cessationism. I believe we're designed for something better. I believe we are called to something better. I believe the Lord has something better for all of us. So with that, let's see what he wants to do. Sound good? Let's all stand.